At least. At least 10 years talking to our first so if they've messed up, it's not my fault. Not your fault. <laughs> well, okay, we can go with that. But so I asked to record this today. So to start the recording, I just want to do a little advertisement for Dr. Pepper, who can endorse me if they wish. So Dr. Pepper, I will be sipping on during this presentation. So um, there we go. So. Uh, as I wipe off the excess Dr. Pepper. And I know that I'm supposed to have that on, but I'm sorry. I'm for my lecture, six foot tall people, six feet radius. So three foot, three foot radius for me is probably about what I want. So that's kind of how I'm figuring. Um, but I have been doing this for a few years. And to start with, I who is messing up your class grade? Like, is there one student that is just pissing all of you guys off? That like you is always getting an A, always turning in their assignments like two weeks before. I need that person. Who is that person or that volunteer? Somebody call them out or, or, or. All right, I need whoever is the worst student here then, but I need that volunteer. So if somebody could come up here, you would find young man about midway back, halfway back. Yeah, you, you're. but stay three feet away from me. And then I'm catching this, so it's coming at you. So what I want you to do with that, so I want you to use that Sharpie right over here on one of these boards, either one, but I want a big negative dollar sign. Negative dollar? Yeah, negative dollar sign. <laughs> Just don't worry about it, man, dude. You're already failing and it doesn't matter. You're No, I'm serious. You're good. Get it, get, yeah. It's on her. Trust me, <laughs> trust me. I want it big. Don't mess this up. My mom's watching. That's pretty good, that's pretty good. Okay, and actually, does it wipe off? I mean, go ahead, you can try it. Don't go for the wet part, but just go for... Dude, you are screwed. So like, basically, like, all I know is that you're doomed and like the rest of you guys, at least one down, how many more to go? So your, your competition just got a lot greater. Um, and we could actually like probably put that thing down now, but I want that to stick in your head. So um, that symbol pisses me off. And it's, it's like a really, um, it also is a motivator. It impacts my life. So as I talk to you today, I want that to be permanently and fixed in your mind, that negative dollar sign. Because what I am to many of your colleagues, to many of your bosses, to all of the insurance companies, to people in health administration that you're gonna see down the road, that's exactly what I am, is a negative permanent dollar sign that's costing the system money. My quality of life is less than yours. I have, a, you know, I'm not worth anything. I'm negative, I'm a negative permanent number. I want that to resonate. And because for me, that actually pisses me off. And that actually like has been my whole life. So that's, that's what I've, I've known from my whole life. I'm double your age, so it's been a while. But I wanted to, to start off with, I, I am Steve Hatch. I'm actually one of the owners of Hatch Family Chocolates. So um, yeah, that's mostly just to make you hungry. But has anybody even been to Hatch Family Chocolates? You guys have been, and it's okay. So, well, it's not my fault. So it's it's not it's we have really great staff, but you know it didn't always start like that, and that's just kind of like it, it resolved and it's evolved all through my life. But it, I kind of started out adorable. So like so this is me as a child. Um, but you know my my birth mother um, when I was born she had diabetes really bad. And she was told not to have children. And she kind of didn't listen to that. So she kind of ignored that. And she knew that she had to have one more child, which was me. Um, all of us were premature. So I was about two months premature um, when I was born. When I was born, the doctors just, it was a, a normal birth relative, 
I mean, compared to somebody having diabetes, but it was normal. I did Dr. Pepper. But um, so that's how I was born. And um, it was cesarean, it was planned. And I, I was born like that. My mom actually thought something was wrong right up front. She thought that something was a little different, something was off. Um, but nobody believed her. Even the doctors didn't believe her. They just thought she was over exaggerating and that there was nothing wrong with me and that I was fine. So that she was just being hypersensitive. Um, as I aged, you know, my arms and legs stopped growing normal. Um, and they, it was obvious that was, something was wrong, but they couldn't figure out exactly what that was. And so they actually took me to a bunch of different doctors. They took me up here to the U. Um, I did all kinds of blood tests. They sent them to everywhere. They sent them to geneticists all around the country um, to try to figure out what was wrong for me. Way back then, it was a little harder than it is now to get genetic results. So it took a lot of time. And so they thought I had Down syndrome. They thought I had a different type of dwarfism that would be lethal, you know, just last a few years and then I'd die. So they told my parents all that. Um, my mother at the time started to think that my whatever was wrong with me with me was caused by her diabetes. So during this time, um, I don't remember, I was two, um, so I was really young, but my mother was in a car wreck with um, all of our family and she was killed. So there was actually um, myself, my brother and my sister, we were all in the same car, she was, she was killed. So it happened over Labor Day weekend. The following, the end of that month, the doctors came back with the results of what I had and it was pseudoechondrodysplasia. And it was actually a Dr. Ramon from UCLA that had worked with Dr. Carey, who I think just recently re retired from the U of U. But he, um, so they found out I had pseudoechondroplasia. My mother never knew that. So she actually, up until that point, blamed herself with my dwarfism or whatever I had. So that's, that's kind of me at a young age. Um, but it really didn't impact me too much. I had a normal childhood. Um, I do remember my father, when I was about four and a half, five years old, met my bonus mom, who's over here up here. But this, so this is Beth. So um, my, my dad met her when I was about four or five. And I think she, obviously I was adorable. You guys saw that last picture. So like, I think it was an easy sell for him. But like, I mean, the rest of my siblings were kind of like the negative and I kind of brought it up. But so my, my stepmother became my mom and they raised me just like any other child. Um, they actually, I, we, I dip chocolates, which impacts me now. Um, don't worry, none of the chocolates we dip at our shop were dipped by me because I suck at it. So you can see that I'm very horrible at it and my sister eats all of them before I'm done. So like, that's actually, you know, other than that, like we had a normal life. I, I learned how to, you know, do everything. I went to school just like everybody else. I went to kindergarten um, and I did just what everybody else did. And I do remember at one point playing basketball and I apparently was really good at dribbling, but I never made a shot. So, but nobody could steal from me because the ball was too low. They couldn't steal from me. So, but I, I really loved basketball. And I remember, you know, I just did what everybody else did. I do remember going to elementary school and at elementary school, it was Barrett Elementary in American Fork. And I went down to Barrett Elementary and it was a brand new school when I first got there. That handle still on the door, but it was thanks to me. So there should be a little plaque kind of by that handle and, and memoriam or whatever honor of Steve Hatch. So anytime you go to Barrett, just remember me. But I remember like none of it was accessible when I first went to school. And the principal, I think, was pretty good at just kind of observing and seeing what was wrong. And it took my teachers a little longer because I think there were times when I would go to the bathroom and I still remember being stuck in the bathroom and I couldn't open up the door from the inside of the bathroom. And so I think the teacher liked it because they left me there a long time. And so I was probably a little delinquent. So they appreciated the freedom of me not being there. But as, as soon as it happened multiple times, they ended up putting things on the handles so that I could open the handles just like everybody else. I sat in a chair just like every other student. Um, and I pretty much just attended school just like anybody else. Um, my, my mother raised me just like all the other kids. I had to do chores. I remember though, they tried to get me to mow a lawn once 
and I hit every sprinkler head. So I never did that again. So like, but they, they made me do everything just like all the other children did. I, my job was folding clothes though. So that's what I had to do. Um, but she raised me just the same as everybody. Um, and it, it was really important to them that I learned to not have everything catered to me. If I wanted to drink a water, I had to climb a bar stool, climb up onto the counter, and then balance on my toes to reach a glass to get it down, to then jump down, move the stool, get it back on the stool, get a drink of water. That's how I had to do it every day or every time I wanted water. But um, that's how they did it. They raised me just to be normal. Um, and I probably have so many different things, but I remember about fifth grade, my parents became acquainted with an organization called Little People of America. Um, and they have these big national conventions. It was began by a man named Billy Barty, who was an actor. And he started this organization for little people to socialize. But one of the benefits of Little People of America was actually doctors would go to these clinics and do free clinics for all these little people. And I, I met a, a doctor there. His name was Dr. Kopitz. And at the time, um, I was about 12, 13 years old. And I remember still at my first conventions being kind of like a punk. And um, I just remember looking at other little people thinking I could take them. And so like, so like that's what I was kind of just, you know, I just looked at it like that. And um, Dr. Kopitz met me and he, he was from Baltimore. So he actually did orthopedic surgery out in Baltimore and he started to specialize in just little people. And at that time he told my parents, Steve has this type of dwarfism. He's going to have X amount of surgeries. His basically, I didn't have a hip socket. So like your hips are supposed to go in like this. Your femur kind of meets with the pelvis and it goes in. My femur hit the side of my pelvis and it would just rub it. And so my ligaments were really loose. And what Dr. Kopitz said is if I don't do anything, he's going to be paralyzed, um, you know, as he gets older. So they wanted to do some surgery and the surgeries were pretty extensive and they were really long. My family, we had a big family. There were 11 kids. We didn't have a ton of money. And so my family actually talked with Kopitz and they're like, so no other doctor can do this here. And um, he was like, no, you know, I've been doing this with a ton of little people. I have seen them for 20 years. I know the outcomes. I know where they're gonna be at. And so my, my family thought, well, let's talk with some doctors in Utah. So they actually did come to a renowned orthopedic surgeon that I think is about retired now, but he was in his best um, at the time. And he, um, he, he, I've seen articles written about him. He's supposed to be amazing. He told my parents to have Dr. Kopitz write down what he does and he would do the surgery here. We never went back to him because, you know, I, I'm a guinea pig all the time. And so all this doctor wanted to do was to treat me like a guinea pig. He had no clue what the hell he was doing. He actually just thought he could do it because he's the best and he was the best in Utah. So he told my parents to write it down and I'll, I'll have no problems with him. I actually have seen other little people who did have surgeries from him who ended up in wheelchairs. Um, so I saw that happens all the time. My family chose wisely and we decided to go to Baltimore. Um, and it, I remember we drove out there. Like we didn't even have a lot of money to fly back and forth. So we drove to Baltimore. And it was a primary children's hospital. I remember not really knowing what I was getting into, but I'm sure my parents did. And um, they, I went into the hospital, it was a 12 hour surgery. So he did my right hip first and he even was in the surgery so long, it was 12 hours that he was in surgery. He would catheter himself so that he wouldn't have to leave the surgery to go and actually have bathroom breaks. But he came out and um, he, my, my parents, my mom could probably tell you, he was sweating, he was exhausted, but he had nothing left. He left everything in the room, in the operating room. And when I woke up, I looked like that pretty much. And so you can kind of tell, but it's old school. I, and I know these pictures are crazy and had great drugs, but um, I, it's so I, it was primary children's hospital. And I woke up looking exactly like that with the spike of cast. This was not Johns Hopkins, by the way. It was actually a children's hospital in Baltimore. And, and the doctor was from Johns Hopkins, but he operated at children's. And the children's hospital, Ruthann, who thinks she knows all, actually, we, which will come in handy in the future. 
So like, so I have to keep reminding her these things, but the children's hospital was an old hospital and it was actually like this huge, it almost looked like the old Shriners building up in Salt Lake. So it was that kind of era of a children's hospital. So kind of spooky at night, but I woke up um, in a cast. I couldn't sit up. So I had from my belly button all the way down um, a cast. And I remember you can kind of see there's drains coming out of the cast. It wasn't even the cool fiberglass cast. This was like plaster, so it was pretty heavy, but I just couldn't move. And then two weeks after this, I had another surgery on my left hip. And it was again, another 12 hour surgery. Um, so the whole time I was in the hospital, that was a month, two weeks after my left hip doing the same process, they did my right knee. And then two weeks later, they did my left knee. So I was in the hospital in Baltimore at the Spooky Children's Hospital for about two months. Um, and, it, and, and then I remember coming home and they sent me home in a cast, just that, it, I'd probably a newer one, but it was a cast just like that. And I remember going home, that's Dr. Kopitz. I must've really been on good drugs because I was smiling. <laughs> Demerol and morphine. But I came home and I was kind of like this. So I was in that cast and it, my mom actually made, um, pants for me. My siblings used to tease me. They, you could see they're Velcroed, so they would start unvelcroing it just to scare me. Um, but I was dependent on my family or somebody to do everything, like to go to the bathroom, to go anywhere. Um, a lot of little people that had these same surgeries would do homeschooling. My mom was great, and this is why she was never invited before, because she made me go to school. So they made me go to school, like on a on a wheelchair, just like that. Well, with the shirt. But, but I, so I, I actually had to go to school on a wheelchair, laying down flat. And I remember all my other friends, they had homeschooling at home, but you saw me in the cast. I remember being in the basement of our house and my mom would go run errands or all the people were upstairs, but the best TV was downstairs. And I remember thinking, what if the house catches on fire? And um, I couldn't move. So I was just like, so all those thoughts would go through my head. So I was really dependent on everything. But I did my, I did my surgeries. I did the two or three months recovering with the cast on. And at this time I went back to the same children's hospital, Ruthann, but we had transferred to a new one called St. Joseph's um, at the time. But it, we started at children's hospital and I started therapy and they took off my cast. And I remember when they took off my cast, everything was really sensitive. So even a sheet touching my skin burned and it was really, it hurt. So I remember that. And I remember they had to teach me how to walk. So I learned how to walk in a swimming pool. I had a walker and then I went to a, a crutches like this. Um, and my doctor said, okay, you'll be home for a few months, four or five months and then you'll be recovered and you'll be able to walk without your crutches. Well, I came home and I actually could never get off the crutches. So I, and I didn't know why. Dr. Kopitz started to take some more x-rays and it was determined that the hips weren't really holding and they were kind of popping out. And so it was allowing, it, it wouldn't allow me to walk. So he said, I needed to go back and do surgeries. This time to St. Joseph's in Towson, Maryland. And it was a Catholic hospital. But St. Joseph's, Dr. Kopitz was there. And my family, again, drove me out there. Oh, one other thing. That cast that you guys saw me in, I drove, or we rode in a Volvo from Baltimore to Salt Lake. No air conditioner for people who have an old school like um, Volvos. So I had to lay on the back seat for 2,000 miles, like just looking at the ceiling of a Volvo. So, um, so, but I remember like we had to do that back and forth. But so... Anyways, finding out I'm gonna have to do the surgeries again, that is like, oh, great. I get to go in the Volvo again, back and forth. And so Cop Dr. Kopitz did the same procedure. He did my right hip again. And then two weeks later, he did my left hip and he didn't have to do my knees this time. But he, I went home again in the body cast, went through school. I was at home for two or three months going to school in that body cast. And then I had to go through the same process. I went back to St. Joseph's um, and I did the physical therapy where they taught me how to run or how to run in a pool, but how to walk and even just like do basic things like that. 
at this time, my parents, you know, my, my mother had a, a family that she was trying to take care of. My father had used up all of his work, his sick leave and the family leave. And I'm sure by then our insurance was like crazy. I'm sure we'd spent, you know, hundreds of thousands um, if, of, of dollars for these surgeries. So my family couldn't leave anybody there. I was by myself this time. And I remember going through the therapy and like trying to, to learn how to walk at the therapy. And Dr. Kopitz came back and he started to cry. And he said, Steve, it didn't work. You're gonna have to do your hip again. And so he's like, you need to do one of your hips. I hadn't even finished therapy at this point, but they sent me home, scheduled the time for surgery. I had to go wake up 12 hour surgery, um, come home to Utah in the body cast for a third time. Um, and then go to school again with the body cast. And then at that point, I remember going back to Baltimore to learn how to walk again. And at this point, it looked like the same process. Like I was just gonna it never get off of crutches. And I, I remember going back to, to Utah and I was just kind of bummed. And I, I, I just kind of thought I had to do the surgeries if I ever wanted a chance of walking again. Um, but I was, just didn't really know what to expect. But I made a dumb bet with my high school basketball team. And at that time, I actually like made them a bet that if they went to the playoffs, I would learn how to walk. And they did. So they, they actually went to the playoffs. They learned how to walk. And I, I started doing therapy kind of with the basketball team. But I remember like just walking maybe five feet without a, a crutches. And then it would be six feet, eight feet. And then it, pretty soon it was a half court. And then it was the full court and they kind of helped me to start to walk again. So I actually got to walk again without the crutches. And it was about my junior year of high school um, about that time. So I had to do a lot of school in a cast, but I, I remember at that point, you know, just being like any other person, um, bathrooms were fun. I'll keep that up. Actually, I'm going to go back because I want to talk about after this, so I, I, I ran for student council and, and senior class, and I became like the senior class president. Um, and then I turned 18, 19, growing up in Utah, most youth Mormons would go on a Mormon mission. And able to do that, I'd have to have all these pins from all those surgeries taken out. My family didn't have a ton of money, again, to go back to Baltimore. Um, so they, they, they thought that a local doctor, and I don't want to say his name because I actually am recording this, but it's a, a good friend of ours um, from American Fort. And he was a doctor that worked on all of the football team and all the athletes. And he was really good. And he told my parents, oh, I've done pins. I've taken pins out of a lot of athletes and I've removed them. It should be an hour long surgery. So I remember graduating from high school where I was a senior class president. I, the week before I was not graduating, you know, I played a little bit. So anyways, I graduated barely and then I ended up right after graduation, going to surgery and doing the pins taken out. Well, the doctor actually was supposed to be in there an hour after six hours, he came out to my, my parents and he was just kind of freaked out. My family told me um, that he was just really nervous. And he was, he's like, I couldn't get them all out. And um, I, I, I couldn't get all the pins out of him. So there was, I don't know what to do. I left him in. And at this time, Dr. Kopitz had actually sent his tools to that doctor to remove, had given him all of his contact information. So if he had problems to call him, the local doctor, you know, he, at the time to have pins left in you was pretty common. And as long as they weren't protruding the skin, it wasn't going to cost any damage. So this doctor thought, and I, I ended up going on a Mormon mission um, and I served just like everybody else. I, except I was in a car, so I was spoiled. Um, every now and then I would ride on a bike with a, a missionary, but I was kind of a, I was crazy. And if I, if my mom knew half the stuff, um, yeah, I was just kind of, I'm not really a rules person, but um, anyway, so I did, I did my, my mission um, and I came back. And as soon as I got back from my mission, I actually went to one of those little people conventions I didn't try to beat up anybody this time. I just let it go. But I knew I could if I needed to take them. But they were just a little older. Um, but I, I saw Dr. Kopitz at, at this clinic. And he looked at my x-rays and he started to get mad at me. And he yelled at me. And he's like, you're 23. You still have those pins in you. 
And he was upset. He's like, I thought you had a doctor take him out. And I told him the story that the doctor, you know, had did the best he could, but at the time he left him in. And Dr. Kopitz was pissed. And he said, you have to have those out immediately. He scheduled the surgery for me to go back to Baltimore. And, and I was like, well, what's the big deal? They're just under my bone. There's way stuck in there. And he, what Dr. Kopitz was able to see at that time is he knew 10 to 20 years down the road, I was going to have to have hip replacements. And so he said, Steve, where those pins are, they're in your femur. That's where the spike for your hip replacements are going to go. If those pins are still there, your bone's going to disintegrate and fall apart as soon as they hammer it in and you're going to be paralyzed. So it won't work. He's like, you needed those out two years ago or three years ago. So your bone has plenty of time to heal. So I had no clue. The local doctor would have had no clue either. And what was kind of interesting is the insurance companies would fight me at this time. And they're like, why are you going back to Baltimore? Any doctor in Utah could do this. And the doctor in American Forks started to become an ally. And he started to write letters to my insurance companies saying, look, there is no specialist in the state of Utah qualified to do these surgeries. And he told me to never trust anybody else except for somebody that was qualified with little people. Um, so it kind, of, it kind of was a compliment that he did that. Um, but that, that was the doctor. I knew back then when I was 25 that I would have to have hip replacements. And then I ended up, um, you know, just living my life, trying to not think about any things like that. But I remember being really tired. There would be times when I could walk maybe a, a, a quarter of a block and I'd have to rest. Um, but that's about in 2003 is when we started our chocolate shop um, down in the avenues. One of the reasons we started it is because I knew that my insurance premiums were way high. And I knew that any time I could be cut from a company, um, if they were trying to cheapen their insurance premiums for their companies. So for me, I wanted to be in a position where it was myself that I was employing um, and that I, you know, insurance was up to me. When we looked for individual insurance, I didn't qualify um, I, because of my dwarfism. Um, that's a pre-existing condition. I, I'm very political about that now. And I, I am opposite of some of my family, but I, I totally was pissed off. I also knew that the lifetime um, maximum money that they would pay is a million dollars. And so I was way past that by the time I was in my 20s. And so I didn't qualify for any insurance. Katie and I decided to open up our shop um, in the avenues and we started to do the chocolates. Um, one of the things for that was health insurance. Katie and I at the time were not married and so we became two or more people working for the same company, which was the definition of insurance companies group plans. So even if they wanted to, they couldn't deny me, I could sue them. And so, so that's how we kind of got around and we got insurance. As soon as we were to get married, then they, they actually told us that we no longer qualified for insurance because we were now a single group. So, I mean, that's, that's still an ongoing thing. Um, I am very pro um, the Affordable Care Act, because of that. And, um, you know, no matter where you are on politics, up until that point, every single little person would qualify as a pre-existing condition. Every one of us would be maxed out at a million um, for the lifetime access for that. Um, and it was just because I was born. Had my mother, way back then, when, I, when she had diabetes, chosen to abort, that would have been covered because actually she was diabetic, she was at risk, they, that would have qualified um, for the insurance, but me being born would not. So, you know, just all of those are just differences that I want you guys as doctors to get pissed at and to think about for all of your careers um, of, of what it did. Since that time, I have done quite a few things. I actually, you know, prior to opening up a shop, I was a student body president down at Utah Valley. I was, um, I, I ran for city council. I lobbied for funding. I've met governors. I met all kinds of things. Um, the shop, going back to that, just for a chocolate shop, you know, the ADA rule is a toilet has to be 19 inches off the ground. So, I mean, I'm a good aim, but like I would have to climb on a stool every time I wanted to pee. And so I wasn't going to really do that. But, um, you know, so I, 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 I I was like, I'm not going to do that. 
do you want a doctor's note saying on a little person, whatever. But, you know, other than that, there's really not a lot of things where it really impacts me. Every now and then going to public bathrooms or hard to reach things, clothes. My mother actually was, would alter a lot of my clothes growing up. I used to make jokes, but she's here, so I'm not going to make that joke. She did a really great job. But if anybody knows what tough skins were, I know they were from Sears way back in the 70s. They had a knee pad, not a shin pad. Just letting you know. Um, and then, you know, I learned how to drive just like everybody else. I have pedals that are hooked to, to the pedals. Airbags. Um, a lot of little people freak out because airbags are really close to the steering wheel. Um, technically, it could go off and decapitate me. Um, I guess my theory is that's a good story. Um, so like if that's how I go um, and I, I, you know, in some ways I'd rather risk it because I, I mean, without an airbag, I mean, you're gonna have internal bleeding and longer death. So maybe decapitation is not so bad, but I, you know, I'm gonna take my chance. It's probably one 10% chance is kind of how I figure. Shopping is really fun. At our chocolate shop, I don't know when you guys go in, but like I can't be seen. Nobody can see me. And so like even when I'm trying to help people, nobody can see me at the chocolate shop. Um, behind, and you can't really see it in this picture, there's stools all over the place. So all of our tall employees trip on the stools or they're like getting kicked or kicking the stools. But we have these stools all over the place. But other than that, you know, I figure I'm not going to be the only one serving customers forever. That I, mean, I want tall people, to token tall people. Um, blood pressure is an issue. And I want to go back to nailing what Dr. Kopitz had told me way back when. So when I was 20 something, he told me I'd have to have hip replacements. Um, in 2003, I actually did not need to have hip replacements. At this time, Dr. Kopitz had long passed away. That organization called Little People of America had thousands of, of members, and I could see which little people went to which doctors and what their results were when they had the hip replacements. And so at this time, I actually needed to get my hips replaced. And there was a doctor in Cleveland named Dr. Mateacek at the, the Cleveland Clinic. Um, again, Dr. Callahan, Dr. Callahan, sorry, I said his name, but the doctor in American Fork that was great. Um, he actually wrote um, a letter and it, it helped me so that I could get the insurance company to cover Dr. Matea check. I met her the day before my surgery. So I flew in um, she couldn't logically or technically treat me until she saw me. So a lot of it was back and forth, just sending emails, but she was able to see and to, to make custom hip replacements from the x-rays. And so she had all that planned. I went and had my, my right hip done. Um, as soon as I met her, I was like, I don't care what your bedside manner is. I just want to walk and I've seen your results. And she kind of laughed and she said, no pressure. And I'm like, nope, but I'm counting on you. So, um, so she, she did my right hip and there's still, because Dr. Kopitz had left one small drill bit and one of my femurs that had broken off from one of those 12 hour surgeries. And she didn't know what was going to happen when she went in with that hip. And it, well, as soon as she went in, it just kind of shattered. And I think there's little pieces of a drill bit somewhere in my bone still. But um, it's, it's the, the spike for the hip went through and I'm fine. I'm walking. But as soon as I woke up, I had dropped foot and I couldn't I couldn't feel my foot and I couldn't move it. And so I had planned to have my left hip done just a couple of weeks later. When I woke up with the drop foot, she didn't want to do that because she didn't know how permanent it would be. She told me that it would come back and to just trust that my feeling would come back, my motion would come back. And I remember it, this was before I had the current shop at our location. So I remember recovering at home and I remember laying in bed and I couldn't be, get comfortable. So I would end up going onto the couch and I would take my phone and I would listen to music. And I would listen all night long because I would have these weird spasms and I would have all these things, but I couldn't move and I wanted to move my foot. And I just remember staying up all night and I could do that because 
I owned my own company. And if I called in sick, <laughs> I'm calling in sick to myself. And so, um, so um, it did make Katie work a lot harder. So you guys can thank her anytime you see her at our chocolate shop. But she, she took over the shop and I recovered at home. But I remember listening to music and I would tap my foot and I would start tapping it and trying to move with the beat. And it took a, a few months, but I was able to get the full range back, the, um, all the filling back for my drop foot. So Dr. Matejcik was right where she said, just trust it'll come back. Um, and I did. Anyways, after it came back, I went back to Cleveland to get my left hip done. I know there's so many surgeries, you guys are falling asleep, but I, I ended up getting my left hip done. And it, when I came back to Utah, recovery was great. Um, I ended up, one mistake was not having a local doctor out here at this time where I went back to for a follow-up. And so as I was recovering, things kind of were going normal. I thought it was great. I had little pain and a, my physical therapist said, oh, you kind of have some red and some irritation in that area. That's a little warm to the touch. You may want to look it out or look at it. And I, I looked at it and I said, yep, it looks reddish, but I just kept on going. I again, don't listen to people. So um, it, it turned into um, where I got really sick. And when you get off of pain medicines, you get the chills, you go through nausea, you go through all kinds of stuff. I thought that's all it was, is that I was fighting that. And I ended up um, a local internal doctor, an internal medicine doctor took a CAT scan and it showed an abscess in there. And it was over a Labor Day weekend. And he said, you need to go to the hospital right now and have that looked at. And I'm like, okay, well, it's kind of a holiday. So maybe I should wait. And he said, no, you actually need to go right now. Um, and I remember going up to our shop and, and just telling the high school kids, I'm like, I need to go get an abscess removed, whatever the hell that is. And in my mind, I thought it was like, they put a syringe in, they drain something out. And um, I had no clue what that really meant to have an abscess removed. But it, um, I told Augie and Landon, I'll see you in a few hours, I'll be back. And I remember going up to the ER at LDS hospital um, and, and they, they did my blood work and they came in and they said, you're, you have zero white blood cells right now. Like all of your, you have nothing. And um, they didn't have a, an on-call doctor in the hospital, but he was down at the IMC. So he had to come from IMC to go up to LDS hospital. His name's Dr. Hilliard. And he was an orthopedic um, trauma surgeon. And Dr. Hilliard, actually looked at me and he said, Steve, I don't know what to do with you because I want to send you back to Cleveland, but you'll die before you make it. Um, he said, you won't make that flight. Um, you'll, you just have zero white blood cells. He said, your hip, your hip replacements are custom. We don't even have anything like them in Utah. Um, if I go in, I might have to cut your leg off. Um, you might lose your leg. You actually, that might be one bonus because the other is you might actually die. I might not, the infection might be so bad that there's no way I can even do anything and you're going to die. Um, and I just went from what the fuck, like I, I just, you know, I went from like thinking it was going to be a syringe that they could take stuff out to all of a sudden being told I was going to die. And I remember at this time, actually my phone rang and it was my mom because, and um, I couldn't talk with her and I started to cry. Um, but I just, um, I made um, somebody else talk with her. But I, I just remember thinking, I'm really going to die. And I, I, all my energy went from my face. Um, and I just, I was thinking I was going to die. Um, Dr. Hilliard ended up doing that surgery at like 11 at night. And it was supposed to take just a, a, you know, 40, 50 minutes. It took him three hours. But I remember going into the surgery and I just thought, do the best you can do. And I actually, I said it to him. I'm, I'm like, do the best you can do. <laughs> and, but it, I honestly didn't think I was going to wake up. And um, I thought I was going to die. And then I also thought if I did wake up without a leg, I would prefer to not wake up. And so I, I all those thoughts went through my head. Um, but I woke up and I woke up wide awake. Um, I was not sick from any of the anesthesia, which all these other surgeries I was. Um, and I just remember thinking, man, I'm alive. So I guess I made it. 
And, and, and you know, from that point on, Dr. Hilliard was the best for that position. And then the biggest thing is if you ever hear from about him, he's a very anal doctor and he's very meticulous and the nurses hate him um, because he is very meticulous and he's a, he's, um, he's a perfectionist. What he did is he went through every layer of muscle um, to make sure there was no um, infection underneath it. And so what could have spent an hour, he took three to do. Um, and I ended up healing. The lesson from that was, yes, get a specialist that works with little people, but also have a local doctor following up to look at your scars, because I may have been able to avoid the abscess with some of that stuff. Um, I, the, I also learned that life is kind of a lesson and you just kind of deal with it. So going back to this, we, we opened up our chocolate shop. We moved to the, where we're at in the avenues now. And I remember a couple of years ago feeling sick and I, I just thought I had a cold and I, it was in December and they took my blood pressure and my blood pressure was sky high. It was like two something. I mean, it was like close to 300, but it was like, they, it was way high. And I ended up with um, what was heart failure. And so they, I had had some infection that killed my heart. And so it impacted that. So it gave me heart failure. So heart blood pressure on little people is really important. It's hard to get that accurate, but Anyways, I'm, I'm alive. So, you know, again, my attitude is I'm still alive. I have the chocolate shop. So no matter what comes at you, you're still kind of, you just go with the, the flow and just keep going. Because I'm alive, because of all the surgeries that I had growing up, we do do really amazing things at the chocolate shop. And I know COVID's kind of put a damper on a lot of it, but we actually host outdoor movies. We have kids that eat ice cream. <laughs> adults that eat ice cream. But I kind of figure life is an adventure. And like, sometimes you just kind of like need to live on the edge. My mission, I met Shaquille O'Neal because I was a little person. He remembers me anytime he sees me. So, you know, had I had not been, I'm supposedly his bodyguard. We've met presidents. And I love this picture because I think none of those things would have happened without me. And none of those things would, have, would not have happened if somebody looked at that negative dollar sign and continued to think that I was just you know, going to drain money. So what I wanted you guys to know is that despite the negative income of some of those medical procedures, that my quality of life is great. The reason I come to you guys is they actually do know the chromosome that causes my type of dwarfism. They actually are treating with therapeutic drugs right now when an infant, before they're even like born, when they're an embryo, they're actually treating it to try to get rid of achondroplasia. To me, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Honestly, I mean, it, it's no different than what the Nazis were trying to do way back in World War II. And I say that where some people don't even know what that means, but it is, they're trying to make a perfect race and they're trying to get rid of some difference. Yes, I'm little, what does it really impact? What is my quality of life? Is it impacting the way I live day to day? Is it impacting the way that we make chocolates? Is it impacting the way that I go about my life? Is it impacting you know, the customers that come into my shop? Is it impacting the people that I meet day to day? What would that have been if it had been different? Any one of you or me driving out today might be hit by the next car we see and we become paralyzed and you have to use a wheelchair the rest of your lives. That's a fact. So to me, what is a perfect you know, person? What is a perfect scenario? You guys as doctors are going to be vital in trying to tell people what is the quality of life for this little person that's going to be born. You're going to be telling the parents who are afraid that this little person is going to be born. My sister Ruthann is over here. I actually have my niece who is a little person. Um, my sister and I butt heads a lot and we actually argue a lot because there's things that I think local doctors here overdo that don't need to be done and it could complicate something down the road. Um, my, my asking you guys is don't be afraid to say that you don't know what the hell you're doing and that I should go see a specialist. After Dr. Hilliard, removed my infection. I went to a local doctor that was patented some um, hip replacement. And he said, well, why didn't you come to me to have your hips replaced? 
And I said, how many little people have you done? He's like, oh, I've, I've seen dozens. And I said, name one. And, and he didn't, he was full of shit. So, but my, my point was, he didn't know what he was, you know, he didn't know the long term. Dr. Kopitz knew what 30 years down the road would impact me. And other specialists may know that. And so don't be afraid to be the ally, like my family friend in American Fort to say, Steve, don't go to anybody else except the specialized. I want you guys to be that person and to be able to do that. Um, blow fire sometimes. <laughs> I'm gonna leave that up on the board, but I also want, um, who's, who was that volunteer? Oh yeah, the guy back in the, that's getting felled out of class. Um, I'm gonna have you come back up. And I guess we can watch this video too at the same time, but we might move the screen back up. Again, I'm gonna stay three feet away from you. Um, what I want you to do, so if you think that Steve's an, an ass or something, I, I want you to go over this dollar sign, just somewhere right on it. One thing that maybe the next little person might impact you, and if I really am a negative dollar sign, write that. But write, write whatever you guys want. While you're doing that, we can start this too if you guys want. But I, I want you to write on here just whatever you want. What, if you learned something from me today that you didn't know before, write that. And do it on just like a little part. And my main reason is I want to show you guys that this permanent thing that you all think is permanent is actually, it's, I mean, that's just your one take. But once we go over it with all of these different opinions with the dry erase markers, we can erase all of that. So um, that's what I want to go for. You can write whichever thing you want. And, and I have a lot, I do actually have a lot of Sharpies. And up here, I'm, do you want to watch video? Or it doesn't really matter. I skydived. I mean, I skydived. Yeah, the less it is, do what you want. I mean, that, that's the main thing. But yeah, sure. I'm gonna leave these up here. Steve, welcome to Skydive Utah, man. How you feeling? I may die today. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you man. Well, is there any special reason ahead. you came out today, or just random? Ah, just for fun. Awesome. Well, the It'll plane's waiting, so let's get on and jump, okay? Have your student. Have your student. that my mother here raised, it was to make me very like, 
able to cope with all that. And you know, I it's gonna take a lot to, to stop me. Um, so that's the lesson, is just, you know, keep going. Except, again, you probably don't have one left in your class now. He's back in. So, sorry. Anyways, thank you guys. I'll, yeah, I, I actually have heard every question. So if anybody has them, I'll, I literally, again, had to use a bedpan when I was 16. So I've heard everything. But, yeah. I mean, I, I think just that even though I'm so different, I'm a lot like every other patient. Like my feelings are gonna be the same. You can talk to me like I'm an adult, um, that I'm, you know, that I'm I'm not less than you. Um I, you know, honestly, I think my main thing is I, I can see in five and ten years from now, we're you all are going to accept the fact that anybody with dwarfism does not need to be born because I can treat them with this pill. That is going to happen. And to me, that pisses me off. And, and I, if the one thing that I'm, I, it, it, that's a, not necessarily a small thing to me, but that's a reality. And, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, that would have been science fiction. That is a reality. So the small things that you're talking about, Man, I'm talking about wiping out an entire race of people um, just because you don't think that they're this as good as you. So to me, I actually think that looking at things like maybe making the surgeries a little easier, um, some of the therapies would be easier. Um, I, my mom was really good at just trying to make me tenacious and trying to make me learn how to do things. There's a lot of people that expect the world to change for them. It's not. And so I think that's up to the person. And I think your advice as a doctor is just to remind them that they can do whatever they want and to treat them just like everybody else. There might have to be stools that, so that they can reach that cup to get water. And there might be different aids that you can make. But the doctor in American Fourth that actually didn't fit, take out all the pins is a really huge ally for me still, um, just because of what he was willing to do. And originally he didn't see that that was going to be his role. He thought he was gonna be able to get all those stuff removed. I think just being open that you may not know everything and to refer patients to somebody that might know a little more. I, I, I don't know if that helps, but anything else? You guys just wanna get out of here. Um, I do have Hatch Family Chocolate face masks if any, but I only have, I, oh, the volunteer dude, you deserve one. So I, yeah, I'll, I'll give you, but I have a couple. If anybody wants them, I'll just leave them up here. And if you have questions, oh, sorry. Thank you. But I like that. And it, you know, I want somebody to take a picture of that because I really want it for myself. But then we can start erasing that and sh just show you. I'm gonna leave cards up here. The guy that's gonna get booted, I have your mask, I'll hold on to that. But I, I'll stand up here and just, I'll answer whatever questions. <laughs> 